try to make it exciting. Hello and welcome to another episode of our morning program live on NTN. We're coming to you from the Information Command Center. Today is Tuesday. Uh, today is the 3rd of November 2020. My name is Jesse Leons. I'd like to thank you so much for tuning in. If you're watching on air, online, if you're watching our you from our YouTube, our Facebook, uh, on our channel 122, a special good morning to you. We do appreciate you uh, tuning in. Uh, we have quite a few updates for you this Wednesday morning. Uh, and among them, uh, 13 new cases of COVID-19. Initially on Tuesday, the, the 2nd of November, we did get word of... Uh, the 3rd of November, sorry, 19, the Minister of Fishers. We know that recently the, uh, the suspension of the Fishers licenses uh, that was addressed, and the government and Fishers have taken an amicable and unanimous position on the sector's role in helping to protect the nation's borders and the boys training center paving paths in a brand new program we also have mr giles romulus here in studio he's our he's our interview for the morning he is the national coordinator uh, from the jeff undp small grants program here in saint lucia and he will be speaking to us about the upcoming activities of the organization and the recent strides in the last year. So that is coming up in just a moment. I think we'll get into the meat of things at this point in time. A Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020, the Ministry of Health received confirmation of 10 new cases of COVID-19. That was initially Tuesday. All of the individuals following testing for COVID-19 were placed into quarantine as they awaited their results. They have now been transferred into care at the respiratory hospital. Dr. Sharon Delmar George is the chief medical officer. Case number 85 <laughs> is a 32 year old female from the Miku district. Case number 86 is a 32 year old female from the Denry district. Case number 87 is a 68 year old male from the Grosley district. Case number 88 is a 30 year old male from the Viewfort district. Case number 89 is a 19 year old female from the Viewfort district. Case number 90 is a 58 year old female from the Library district. Case number 91 is a 35 year old male from the Grosley district. Case number 92 is a 35 year old male from the Grosley district. Case number 93 is a 41 year old male from the Miku district. Case number 94 is a 57 year old female from the Viewfort district. Uh, my apologies there. We've gotten so used to the chief medical officer seeing her every now and then. Uh, that was Mr. Dr. Glenford Joseph uh, speaking there, giving the update on the new cases, and uh, that being the 10 initial cases that were registered on Tuesday, the 3rd of November. Uh, six of these cases were identified through the contact tracing process, and epidemiological links have been established. We go to our second clip from uh, Dr. Joseph. Cases 85 and 93 are linked to case 61. Case 87 is linked to case 65. Case 88 is linked to case 68. Case 90 is linked to case 69. And case 92 is linked to case 55. This week, the Ministry of Health's public health team will continue to conduct tracing as well as interventions in communities of public health priority to reduce the potential of transmission of COVID-19 within the country. The ministry is grateful for the support that we continue to receive from community leaders as well as residents of the various communities with whom we have been partnering. We ask that while we intensify our response, that we all continue to practice the guidelines to reduce the exposure to the virus. 
The Ministry of Health also recorded four recoveries of individuals who were in care for COVID-19. All other patients in care are stable and do not require critical care. There are at present 62 active cases with a total number of cases diagnosed in country to 94. Now, no sooner did we get that update from the uh, authorities, health authorities on Tuesday, just a few hours later, uh, we got an update of three additional cases being registered on island, bringing the total number diagnosed in country to 97 and the total number of active cases to 65 here on island. The three new cases, case 95 is a 19-year-old female from the Labry district. Case 96 is a 34-year-old from Denry, and case 97 is a 21-year-old male from the Castries district. So please take note of that. Again, these individuals have all been uh, taken in at the respiratory hospital for care. We continue to advise that you adhere to the protocols. You know them already. Uh, as we go about uh, this month's, uh, this month's uh, just heightened awareness of COVID-19 for the next 30 days as prescribed by the Chief Medical Officer. Uh, continuing a half-day meeting between Prime Minister and Honorable Alan Chasney, Minister for Agriculture and Fisheries, Honorable Ezekiel Joseph, and representatives of the fishing sector has resulted in an amicable and unanimous position on the sector's roles in helping protecting the nation's borders and community from the spread of COVID-19. The uh, meeting was convened to discuss the one-week suspension of fishing licenses as government refined protocols for the sector. Now, acknowledging the importance of the fishing sector, its, its contribution to the local economy and food security, uh, the government has decided to allow fishers to resume their operations, their trade, however, only between the hours of 4 a.m. and 7 p.m. daily. Captains or owners of fishing vessels must share information on the vessel with the Marine Police. Uh, the VG Lighthouse must also be furnished with all relevant information when a vessel is leaving port. No more than three people are allowed on board a vessel. Please take note. We go to our clip from uh, the uh, Minister Ezekiel Joseph, Honorable Ezekiel Joseph. We are going to continue revisiting the, the protocols that were set in, in April. And in addition to that, we are going to um, reduce on the hours that they are allowed to go to sea um, and for the next three weeks whilst we look at more medium to long term solutions. Okay. Operations Manager of Goodwill Fishermen Cooperative Society, Kjiana Tuse Shauri, says the meeting was productive on many fronts. As the key clip. Most of the issues we were confronted with as a fisher folk with the news of the week suspension, I think we're adequately able to exploit at the meeting. And what we are most happy about is that our fisher folk will be able to resume work in, in about a day. So we're very happy about, about that news. The statutory instrument containing the measures will be published on Wednesday, that is today, 4th of November. Uh, the measures come into effect on Thursday, 5th November 2020. And at the start of the program, I did indicate that it was 3rd November. And there's a blur between Tuesday and Wednesday for me. My apologies. I, I, I was just telling Mr. Romulus perhaps that he, he may be having that effect on me this morning. <laughs> we continue with the news for the morning. Recruitment is underway to boost manpower at the Department of Environmental Health. And we did indicate that coming off of Friday's press conference with the Honorable Prime Minister, Alan Shasney. Uh, the Department of Health is looking to get a boost as government plans more extensive compliance checks at establishments island-wide. We have Herma DeMarc, who is a new at GIS, with this report. As St. Lucia continues to record new cases of COVID-19, Prime Minister, the Honorable Alan Chasney has announced that the Department of Environmental Health and Safety within the Ministry of Health and Wellness will be receiving additional support to fulfill its mandate. A part of the department's responsibility is ensuring that various institutions are complying with the requirements of the certificates of approval needed to operate safely during this pandemic. As a result, the Department of Environmental Health will be receiving an increase in personnel to aid with carrying out inspections throughout various sectors. We are 
recruiting persons from within the civil service um, to go to the uh, environmental department, um, environmental and safety department of the Ministry of Health uh, to increase the number of, of persons that can do inspections. So they will be going to the grocery stores, going to the banks, going to the restaurants, going to all the different institutions to make sure that what the certificate of approval that they agreed to do, that they're actually doing it. So it's through, inf it's through um, uh, uh, enforcement, but in um, uh, adhering, full adherence to the existing protocols that we're gonna, we're gonna win this battle. Meanwhile, the Chief Environmental Health Officer within the Ministry of Health, Baka Ragnanan, says that significant strides have been achieved in accommodating the influx of persons coming into the island. This includes a reduction in the processing time of individuals at the ports of entry. The actions taken have increased the capacity of the UNORA International and George F. L. Charles airports, even on peak days. We have seen a significant reduction in the in the time phase it has taken to, to clear passengers. Um, it at the beginning took us between two and a half minutes to three minutes to clear one passenger. Currently that has been done in uh, about 45 seconds. So there is a significant um, increase of intake in terms of our capacity to be able to do clearance of passengers. And we've been seeing there are certain days especially on a Thursday and Saturday that they increased number of flights. And even then, um, they have been able to be handled quite well. We continue to administer for additional resources as we see more flights are coming in. But at this juncture, um, the team on the ports are doing a tremendous job and we need to continue to support them and commend them. Ragnanan says the difficulty arises with nationals returning to St. Lucia and their reluctance to comply with the protocols that are in place. A plea is being made to St. Lucians to be understanding and cooperative at the ports of entry and to continue to adhere to the necessary protocols. From the Government Information Service, I'm Huma Dimark, reporting. Thank you, Huma Dimark. That was uh, uh, the incoming uh, one of our joining our team here at the GIS. We'd like to welcome her to the team. Continuing for the morning, the sixth meeting of the OECS Council of Ministers for Human and Social Development uh, ha was held virtually on October 20th, 2020, against the backdrop of the global pandemic that we've been experiencing. The Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, ECCB, revealed that economic activity in the union, the Eastern Caribbean Economic Union, is projected to contract between 5% to 7% in 2020, accompanied by a sharp rise in unemployment. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, a growth rate of 3.3% was forecasted for the OECS region. The meeting was held under the theme, No One Left Behind, Empowering People and Building Resilient Communities. The Minister for Equity, Social Justice uh, Saint, for St. Lucia and incoming council chair, Honorable Leonard Mantout, highlighted the significance of this year's theme in light of the impacts of the pandemic. We go to our clip from Honorable Leonard Mantout. The number of vulnerable persons has become very extensive as people who were once self-sufficient are now on the breadline seeking public assistance. And from my research, there are various factors that serve as the key to understanding who is left behind and why. The five most prominent ones are discrimination, place of residence, socioeconomic status, governance, and vulnerability to shocks. From our vantage point as small islands, small island developing states, we can identify with all of these factors. For many of us, the year 2020 may be considered the most challenging time in the post 9-11 era. This coupled with COVID-19 our societies are plagued with a malaise of problems such as climate change, economic downturns, crime and violence, and a decaying social fabric. And so in my view, if ever there was a time to turn our focus on building resilient and sustainable communities, it is now. Economic downturns. And finally, in our news, the Boys Training Center has commenced a new program designed to not only instill love for the environment in the wards, but also give tangible skills that can help them earn a livelihood. We have the details in this report. 
Environmental awareness is often a leading global topic with various campaigns encouraging people to take responsibility for the cleanliness of their environs. The wards and staff of the Boys Training Center are playing their part in contributing to a clean environment with a multifaceted initiative. As part of this initiative, the boys are given the opportunity to attain important skills. The general manager of the Boys Training Center, Wang Sun Sun, says the activity also affords the participants skills they can use for employment upon leaving the rehabilitation center. What we do here, we give them skills that when they leave, because every boy who lives here will not be academically inclined and they will still need some means of earning a living. So some of them are trained to use the weed eater and they are doing it very effectively. So it's, it's a holistic approach to the boys. Everything we do, it is geared at the rehabilitation and advancement of the boys that we have. The coach and warden at the Boys Training Center, Alvin Augustin Xavier says, in addition to contributing to a healthy environment, the collaboration between the wards and staff fosters a stronger bond of unity amongst the boys. It's a form of um, unity. They're working together and when they see that the staff join them, that will give them more added incentive to, you know, to involve because it is not about you just want us to work. They see that we're taking part also. So basically we're training them how from being boys to men that you need to take care of your, your environment firstly and then around your home because especially we in the hurricane season we need to and uh, make sure the area is safe that when the, the rain comes that we don't have too much flooding and landslides and those kind of things. So they seeing that we um, involving it also will drive them on and motivate them to, you know, take part also. The cleanup activity occurs on the last Friday of every month. From the Government Information Service, the Muddy Mark reporting. Uh, thank you for that last report and well that wraps up our uh, the latest developments coming from the government of St. Lucia uh, to date we do have 30 new cases of COVID-19 here on island we do hope that you are aware of the situation going on around you and taking the necessary measures preventative measures infection prevention measures uh, to help you and to protect you and your family at this time uh, at this point in time, I would like to welcome on set Mr. Giles Romulus, the National Coordinator for the Jeff UNDP Small Grants Program here in St. Lucia. He's here to speak to us on a number of things, including the launch of the seventh operational program of the Jeff S SGD UNDP in St. Lucia. A special good morning to you. Thank you so much for being here. Jesse, thank you for welcoming you to your set and welcome. And good morning, St. Lucia, and good morning, the world. Wonderful. Uh, I know we have quite a bit to talk about in terms of activities yeah. and also the two latest publications coming out of your good office, the annual report for 2019, as well as an inter introductory guide to organic fertilizers and pesticides. We'll come to that in just a moment, but I, I want to have a little bit of an information session uh, to give the general public an understanding of what the Small Grants Program is all about. Mm -hmm. Jeff UNDP, elucidate us. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks for the opportunity. The Jeff Small Grants Program is a creature of the Rio Summit in many respects. Back in 1992, persons would recall we had this big Earth Summit in Brazil, and at that, at that time, the governments of the world wanted to set up a financial structure to fund projects in the environment and sustainable development. I must just going back three years before that, the Brandon Commission report had come out and sustainable development became the new buzzword, if you recall, from around 1987. So 1992, in many respects, was a climax of a period when people began to reflect on the impacts in the environment. And the governments of the world decided, well, with all the conventions we had, like climate change and biodiversity, what is the financial mechanism to implement and to address issues? coming out of development. And it is there that the Small Grants Program came out of, 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 of discussions there. And the Jeff was basically born there. And the Jeff is, is one of the largest, I think it's now the second largest multilateral funding facility in the world. And it has three levels of funding. The upper level are for projects uh, in excess of a million US. And that's uh, uh, significantly for governments. 
and the medium jeff is up to a million us and that's for uh uh, and a private sector could um, access it, but with the support and endorsement of the government. And at the bottom level, we have the Small Grants Program. It's called mm -hmm. the People's Jeff. It has funded, in our program globally, we have funded over 25,000 projects. We're in 125 countries. And we focus on three objectives. Environmental sustainability. As much as possible, use the environment, but don't destroy it. Do no harm to the environment. Poverty reduction, which is critical. We focus um, on the marginalized, the poor people of, of, of different countries, and that's why we are everywhere from South Africa to even China, from uh, Mexico to Cuba, from Democratic Republic of Congo to Samoa. And St. Lucia being one of those countries we are in. And uh, we came to St. Lucia. I used to run the original program out of Barbados, Barbados and the OACS. And around 2010, 2011, the governments of the Caribbean decided that they wanted separate country programs instead of an integrated program. So we addressed that transition, and then I moved to St. Lucia to open up the office here uh, from 2012. So we've been operating as a separate and distinct autonomous country program from uh, 2012 to the present. And what, what opportunities has this provided from the integrated regional approach to the individual? The integrated regional approach um, meant that we had two officers responsible for 10 countries, including seven OECS countries plus the overseas departments of uh, Great Britain, Monstrat and, and Anguilla and so on. With the country programs, you have separate and distinct country programs and you have officers in each, at my level, in each of those countries. So you have more attention being paid to each country and every country now has its own grant budget and its own operational budget as such. And you are free to design projects that specifically fits your country. Whereas at the sub-regional level, we had a more consensus in terms of what is the programming across the region. Uh, we couldn't give the, the, the level of attention that each country required because each country is at a different level. But in this current uh, scenario, we have persons within each country. And whereas in Barbados, I had to jump and liat or Caribbean star in those days and head up to Anguilla for a problem or head up um, to Antigua, right now they have a competent person right in the country addressing the, the issues and, and, and problems. Nice. Mm. Uh, now in St. Lucia, speak mm. to us about the work that has happened so far uh, from the program. How has it changed the, the landscape and understanding of uh, the importance of our environment to the common man. Oh boy, uh, Jesse, it's been a, a wonderful journey and a, a journey of discovery and learning for us. Uh, we started um, in, uh, the f our first grants were given in October of 2012. Between October 2012 and December 2019, we have given 97 grants in St. Lucia. And the investment in St. Lucia has been in the area of 6.39 million US dollars, which is approximately 17.25 million Eastern Caribbean dollars. That is translated into, um, for every one US dollar we have invested in St. Lucia, we, uh, our colleagues, our grantees, raise about a dollar and 44 cents in terms of co-financing. -finan and that's both in-kind and cash co-financing. We have um, generated employment of over 1,600 persons in that time period. Um, and we have trained over 12,000 persons in everything from aquaculture to aquaponics to project management to diving to coral nurseries to organic farming, uh, smart agriculture, desalination, research and innovation. We have basically um, done a significant amount of work in what we call the Jeff Focal Areas. Now, the Jeff has five focal areas, and we need, we operate in all five. Biodiversity, which is really the plant life, the animal life of the world. Climate change, which is topical, the greatest existential threat to humanity. So we operate both in what we call climate change mitigation, the reduction of greenhouse gases entering the environment, and climate change adaptation, where we can build resilience of communities to contend with climate change. And I'll give you some examples in, in the future. Um, we have international waters, our coastal zone, the, the, the vital coastal zone we have in St. Lucia and in small islands. And we've heard arguments that we have a lot more sea than land. In fact, we are first world when it comes to territorial waters and so on. 
So we are concerned about the quality of our coastal waters. We are concerned about chemicals and waste. The chemicals that enter our food chain, the chemicals that enter our water, we are dedicated to reducing it and, and, and significantly um, perhaps phasing them out. Some of them are detrimental to our nervous system, detrimental to the young infant growing in mother's womb, detrimental. In fact, some of my colleagues in the medical profession um, have, have seen some correlations between where the most chemicals are used in St. Lucia and the growth of cancer and so on. Causation has not been established definitively, okay. but there are some correlations have been seen just by clinical observation. Um, very important for us is sustainable forestry. Our forest is life. You might remember the, the refrain of Gabriel Charles and forestry department. Forest indeed is life. If we destroy our forests, we're in trouble. What is happening in the Amazon now uh, is, is of significant importance to us as well. So we covered all the different aspects of the environment, from climate change to biodiversity to water, quality of water, quality of the air, and so on. And in so doing, we are trying to create employment that has a minimal to zero impact on the environment. So we're not saying don't touch. We are saying use wisely, be stewards. Use the environment, create employment, but don't destroy. And at the same time, we are saying, OK, if you are going to do that, Let's build your capacity. Mm -hmm. You know the old saying, you know, you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. But you teach him to fish, you feed him for life. That is an operational concept for us. We want people to learn. Learn. And even in the learning process, they can make mistakes. And in those mistakes, you identify what not to do the next time and to move on. Learning, in fact, research and innovation is, is about making errors, actually. But not repeating the errors. Learning and moving on. So we've done a lot of work in St. Lucia all, all across. I mean, I can give you some examples if you wish. Well, if you could uh, state one of some of the outstanding examples where we've had, we've seen interventions, successful interventions. Uh, what is St. Lucia? Give us a picture of any environmental concerns mm -hmm. that have been addressed through the interventions of this program. Well, the most famous one, and I know how ministers like to quote that one, is the desalination mm -hmm. project that came out of a fissure. And I think there was a program last night on HDS on, on the young man, Carlos Noel, who um, at a workshop in Labry came up with the idea that if we are going to suffer significantly from climate change and water shortages, why not come up with this sal? And he went on and he met all our requirements. And over a period of time, his invention was confirmed to be top edge by uh, Kaffer, the independent uh, researcher. Um, um, CARICOM agency at Mount Fortuny. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that is one that is very... But guess what? Mr. Carlos now Noel is gone on now. To, he's in the phase of designing a, what is called a smart FAD. And that FAD will be linked to, to satellites. And for that technology, we, because we are an international agency, have connected with Microsoft. And Microsoft, they have dedicated two top technicians who are working with us and Carlos to bring to St. Lucia the first smart fads that will not get lost. One of the problems with fads is that sometimes they get lost and they continue to ghost fish. Imagine fish enter those fads and can't come out. And these fads, until they're destroyed, the fish are in there. So you can begin to work out the, 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 the problems. But if a smart fad, you have uh, sensors and you have beacons and they, it's going up to satellite uh, at all times. So you know the, the GPS position at all times. And you can build what is called geofencing. So it doesn't go beyond a certain circumference. And you can find it at all times. What that will do is to reduce the carbon footprint of our fishers. So instead of going out there and saying, boy, maybe it's there. Well, it's not there. Let me go over there. By the time you finish, you wasted maybe $300 worth of gas. And that translates into greenhouse gases and CO2. This time you'll go out and then you'll look at your smartphone and say, ah, longitude and latitude. And you go there. And the probabilities of it being there is very close to one. OK? And so, so that is a technology we're working on with Mr. Carlos. And we hope to start testing very soon. And hopefully next year we could um, announce that to the world. But what is important is the partnership between Microsoft, ourselves, and St. Lucia in that respect. That's one, another thing. Another project that we, we're working on as well, and that one we hope to launch next year, is what is happening out there? Temperatures are changing significantly. Moisture is changing significantly. 
relative humidity is uh, uh, changing significantly. It means our plants are under perpetual stress. Uh, we, we talk about it all the time, the seasons vary. Our plants uh, suffer from that. So uh, a group of uh, young men have come up with the idea of a smart greenhouse. And that smart greenhouse will run on technology, on solar, and will also link to your smartphone. And you would be able in real time to determine in absentia what is happening in the, in the greenhouse and to alter temperature and increase water in that sector or decrease water or increase potassium or whatever. So that's something that is working on and we're hoping to launch that next year. Um, we have done projects in the Fertilus. Um, it's uh, awareness for the National Trust and though it is poisonous, it's not very poisonous compared to the black mamba, the coral sticks that I've seen in, 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 in Latin America and, and some particularly the coral and uh, it potentially has therapeutic value for us. Uh, we have done uh, uh, work on preserving some of our species on the East Coast. Um, CMOS. Yes. In many respects, we've been responsible for the uh, helping to regenerate a CMOS on the East Coast of St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. We funded the Prana CMOS farmers. Nice. We help, um, we help attract solar panels for the processing plant. And you know now there's a boom of for CMOS cultivation on the East Coast. Although I must, might see the, they're looking for some intervention to properly manage because of potential conflicts in the coastal zone. Mm -hmm. And so I pray the elasticity and so on. So there's it's for some um, active intervention. But I must say it's a real boom, almost like a gold rush. When, when we look at the statistics from CMOS now coming into San Jose, it's amazing. Um, I could, wow. one for example, one income stream is something like 660,000 Eastern Caribbean dollars between January and September this year in the midst of COVID. During a webinar, I spoke to the president, <laughs> yes. Mr. Bonaventure. Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Batiste, and he was indicating that it is especially due also to mm -hmm. the recognition that CMOS helps to boost your there you immunity. Go. There you go. And yeah. so due to COVID-19, everybody's mm -hmm. looking for that perfect pill, that perfect thing that, mm -hmm. they, that can prevent them from... Mm -hmm. contracting the virus right, right so definitely it has increased you know the but bringing them to that point bringing them to that point of preparation, preparation. Mm -hmm. three four five years to take them to that but they are there now and i'm very very happy for them that they're attracting significant income mm -hmm. for the people of the east coast in prowl so it's Mabicor been a project so long in the making oh yeah it has been a project that started uh 15, 20 years ago with the work done by the Eastern Caribbean Natural Areas Management Pro Program on the East Coast, South East Coast of St. Lucia, mm -hmm. then Caribbean Natural Resources Institute. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Kath Smith, who is deceased now, did a lot of work in the East Coast, mm -hmm. and now it's beginning to show. But here is my concern. We ought not to fall into the same trap that we fell into for bananas. You see, when there is a boom, we tend not to think of the future. And as I was telling Bonaventure recently, we now have to think of, should we set up an insurance for those sea farmers, um, sea, sea moss farmers? Um, should we now push agro-processing, so added value, we go up the value chain? Should we begin to do those things? So that is when, you know, we, 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 we really need to start to think about the future. Mm -hmm. Another area of significant advancement is apiculture. Yes. I mean, <laughs> Lips and bounds. We've had, we have devoted quite a lot of money to that area, and we are on the verge of elevating apiculture to a industry in St. Lucia. We have, in fact, we must see we are bringing more and more science into apiculture. Of course, with our partners of ECA and the Ministry of Agriculture, um, we are moving up the value chain from simple honey to things like propolis and, importantly, epitoxins. And one of our grantees, the Ayanola Apiculture Collective, has been successful in extracting the epitoxin from bees. Now, epitoxin is used in various medications. It costs, mm -hmm. on the market, if you can get 99% purity, you can get one gram cells of about 90 US. One gram. So if we can mold this into a vibrant, successful industry, we are going to do it. And, and I can tell you how we're going to do it because yeah. we have a point already. Where we, um, we are hopefully going to launch a seven country program uh, in the next three weeks to a month. That includes Trinidad, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, 
Dominica, St. Kitts, and across to the Pacific Samoa. We are looking at the Jeff Global, and we hope to invest about 660,000 US dollars in making St. Lucia the center for research and learning in apiculture. And we're hoping that uh, we'll get the support of the government of St. Lucia to put a research facility in possibly Viewfort, the southeast coast, or some other place where it is uh, suitable. And the idea is to train persons on how, in scientific methods of managing bees mm -hmm. and uh, um, using the byproducts and the products for exports and so on. In fact, one of our colleagues, again, uh, Richard Matthias at I and the ISC, he started experimenting with epitourism. People really want to see no, bees. Yeah, they want to know. Indeed. And several byproducts, candles, rubs, mm -hmm. all kinds of things are coming out of this. The scrubs. Yes, mm -hmm. and scrubs, yes. So we are going to definitely invest in that area. And we want to bring more science into it, so we mm -hmm. have products that are world class and that they, they can be used in the tourism industry and also exported as well. So apiculture is an area for upscaling for us in Jeff 7, and we, we uh, with the, our board has agreed to, uh, led by Dr. Maffrey, Dr. Rosie Maffrey, we've agreed to a significant investment in that area. Okay, wonderful. And now taking a look at the annual annual report for 2019, mm -hmm. uh, I would imagine we would have spoken a little bit a bit of the work uh, mm -hmm. that occurred last year. Uh, but just if you could just round it off for us into what took place last year and what we can look forward to in the coming year. Okay, um, we funded about 14 projects in in 2019, and uh, the investment was somewhere um, about 682,000 US dollars, which is over 1.3 million Eastern Caribbean dollars. Um, we trained about uh, over 5,000 people in 2019. Um, we had um, uh, employment generated about 247 persons were employed. Um, we, we funded projects in agriculture. We funded projects in organic farming. Um, we did some partnerships with the organizations like the St. Lucia Hotel and Tourism Association. This booklet, organic mm -hmm. um, by fertilizers. fertilizers and pesticides was funded out of a project we are funding. The Bellevue Farmers Cooperative in Chozelle must be complemented for undertaking this project and bringing together some of our local researchers and they have brought into one publication uh, how we can use our local plants and animals so biofertilizers and biopesticides. That book is going to be launched on Monday okay. at uh, the launch of OP7 and St. Lucians will be able to access that book. It's very easy, very colorful, very, you know, it's, it's well illustrated. It tells you how to do your own biofertilizers. Like at the household area. level? Yes, yes, okay, yes, nice. yes. Our target household, even young people in the backyard and farmers as well can undertake that and do your own little backyard uh, gardening and know that you're not poisoning yourself by the toxic chemicals you may use and so on. So we are doing a lot of things as well. We also um, began the, the design of our knowledge fair, our second knowledge fair. Yes. And that is coming up and it's going to be a big thing for St. Lucia. Um, we are going to be launching the knowledge fair on the 22nd of November um, at the Financial Center. Okay. And on the 23rd, we are going to do something quite extraordinary. In the parliamentary chamber, we are going to have a four to five hour consultation on research and innovation. The People's Parliament. The People's Parliament. One of our conclusions in um, 2019 is that in the context of COVID and all the challenges uh, from climate change, as a small island developing state, we need to begin to focus on research and innovation. And basically research and innovation at all levels. We see from the bedroom to the boardroom, mm -hmm. from the farm to the kitchen, from the cricketed pitch to the dance hall. Research and innovation can be done at all those levels. So we are bringing together a cadre of what we call luminaries. And, you know, Jesse, I've never been so proud to talk to St. Lucians abroad. We are bringing five St. Lucian luminaries. This is for the parliament? For the People's Parliament People's on the parliament. 23rd. That's going to be broadcast live on all the platforms. Let me tell you about some of them. Dr. Daw at the University of Bristol on the verge 
of marketing in your tests for identification of bacteria in your bloodstream. When you go to a doctor and you have an infection, the doctor sometimes doesn't know what specific strain of bacteria. So he gives you a general, and he or she gives you a general antibiotic and says in three days time, come back if it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Dr. Daw has developed a test that will tell the doctor in his office in 15 minutes which species of bacteria has invaded your blood and therefore get the doctor to identify the most effective antibiotics. That's a solution from Grosely, Babono, and a Sumerian, by the way, and, and wow. so on. We have Dr. Whitney from the south of St. Lucia, you fought in St. Joseph's Convent. Mm -hmm. She's at Harvard, and I think at MIT now. She's discovered the, 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 the trigger for cancer cells to metastasize in the human body. And she's very young. Mm -hmm. Pleasant young lady. With Henry. Yes. Uh, Durand. Uh, Durand. Well. Durand. Mm -hmm. Yes, she's mine. We have Professor Kito Lawrenson from the University of Connecticut. He has been in the 100 best doctors in the United States of America for the last 15 years. He stem cell research, orthopedic surgeon, medical doctor. He is in, he, he, there is an area of research in stem cells that he's considered the father of that area. We have Parry Husbands Jr. Parry, um, I'm, I'm delighted to say, I taught him geography at St. Mary's College, so I'm very proud of him. Uh, a graduate of MIT, he's worked at Microsoft in Silicon Valley. He is into supercomputers and um, artificial intelligence. We have Professor Lee from UWI Mona doing significant work on social policy and, and so on. So we both social sciences and natural sciences. Mm -hmm. and Microsoft will be joining us from the headquarters in Washington, yes. live for Zoom. We are in a partnership with Flo, so we're going to get the broadband we need. In St. Lucia, we're going to identify luminaries in all fields, the disabled, farmers, fishers, doctors, lawyers, who will sit in Parliament. And we are going to discuss the agenda for research and innovation in a small island development state. What should we do? Obviously, we can compare to the Microsofts, but I'm certainly sure that we can. A lot of work can be done on our our biota, on our biodiversity. Uh, if a fisherman can innovate to design a desalinator that works on solar and it is brine neutralizing, why can't a young woman or a young man in Miko do something equally fantastic mm -hmm. and so on? So we want research and innovation to be seen as critical for the survival of this small island developing state we call St. Lucia and for the rest of the Caribbean. And that is why we got into the apiculture um, center of excellence in St. Lucia. And we're going to invest big money in there to make this St. Lucia the, 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 the um, number one <laughs> in, in the area of apiculture training. And we are going to be the area where people can come to to train. Um, so that's the People's Parliament. Out of that, we will get a report and then we have a drafting committee that will put a declaration together and that declaration will go around St. Lucia for consultation. And we hope to finalize it in, uh, either just before independence next year or thereafter, or soon thereafter and then submit it to our, our policy makers and the private sector, etc. So in, we're also going to be launching for the first time the Association of Caribbean Beekeepers Association, under the patronage of the Honorable Ezekiel Joseph, on the 24th to the 27th of November. Mm -hmm. Everything being done, of course, with Zoom, Internet. We are going to have the world's leaders joining us who have done our work in apiculture and apitoxins and beehives from the United States, from France, from India, and from the rest of the Caribbean. They're going to be at the Orchid Garden Conference Room, mm -hmm. and they're going to be discussing uh, the business of the Association of Caribbean Beekeepers, and that will be the first phase of the participation in the Knowledge Fair. Come next year, we're going to have, hopefully, if COVID allows us, we're going to have a beer exhibition where people can actually see for themselves, and we're going to have the first honey tasting competition in St. Lucia. Honey varies in color, texture, taste, and so on. 
and different honeys have different properties. Some of them are very therapeutic, others are less so. So we want solutions to begin to understand those things. So that's going to be uh, in February of, of next year. So the Knowledge Fair is also being done in association with the UWI Open Campus. Mm -hmm. And in February next year, the UWI Open Campus will bring to St. Lucia solutions who are doing groundbreaking work in all aspects of research associated with climate change and climate change mitigation. Leslie Mitchell at the, at the Open Campus, she's working on that with us, mm -hmm. and we're hoping to bring a, a cadre of some of the best researchers to give us information on what we are contending with in this era of, of climate change and so on. So that is going to constitute the Knowledge Fair, um, which will end sometime around February, March next year. Um, what can I tell you? There's so many things I can tell you. Absolutely. So, but how, yeah. how, how can persons tap uh -huh. in, register for the various activities Excellent. Uh, Excellent. that will be happening uh, surrounding the Knowledge Fair? You, you can go now to the Association of Caribbean Beekeepers website and register there. That operation has been operational for the last maybe three weeks or so, and we have people who are, are registering from all over the world. So we hope solutions can go there. Um, I don't have the URL with me, but if you, if you Google Association of Caribbean Beekeepers 10th anniversary or 10th Congress, you can, get, can bring it to the website and you can register there. Um, for the other activities we are going to have in-house, we have to observe the COVID protocol. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be not more than 20 persons, six feet or more apart. But what is important, persons will be able to go to our Facebook page and it'll be broadcast live. Um, one of them, I think, for NTN as well, I think on, on Monday, the event on Monday. And for the other events we are going to have in Parliament, it's going to be uh, broadcast live as well from the Parliament to Sedusha to the rest of the world. Uh, to discuss when we start to discuss the research and innovation and so on. So it's an effort to begin a discourse, a discussion on, on things that are putting into our development in a very dynamic period when there are many uncertainties. But if we take the bull by the horn and we begin to observe and to understand what's happening, you know, I think we will be, be better for that in the next five to ten years or so. Wonderful. Mr. Romulus, our time is running out, but I do, based on everything that we've spoken about this morning so far, I know that there is room for us, you know, uh, expanding in various directions for how this can uh, augur well for our overall development. I'm just thinking about the tourism sector, yes. um, how village tourism and biodiversity, yes. nature yes. tourism oh, well. can benefit uh, from some of what you've spoken about so far. Let me far. talk a little bit about that. Thanks sure. for prompting me on that because <laughs> one of the exciting activities coming out in OP7 is with the people of Fort Saint Jacques. Mm -hmm. The Fort Saint Jacques Development Committee, we have completed uh, solutions, completed a cost-benefit analysis up there for us. Another solution is done in the standards. We are looking at a unique experience in the upper watershed of Soufra. Mm -hmm. The problem there is, you see, uh, there's a lot of erosion, soil erosion that enters the Soufra Bay and that's going to affect our coral reefs. So we are trying to initiate activities that are benign to the environment but create economic opportunity in the upper watershed and we could very well have our f first agro-tourism park in St. Lucia where people can go and have a total unique experience of rest, leisure and also the culinary delights of the people of Sufre as well. As you know, Sufre used to be the bed, bed basket of St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. So we are going to invest in that in a significant way and on board with us will be the SLHTA that is committed to come on board with us as a partner. In canneries, we are hoping that we are going to do something significant in the interior there. Um, I spoke about potential partnerships with universities. Yes. We need to identify a comparative advantage for canneries that can make canneries unique, that can create economic activity. and. I believe um, within the next six months to a year, perhaps when you invite me back here, eh, I'll be able to tell you what, uh, which measures or what uh, benefits we've brought to the people of Canaries. We've already invested quite a lot there, but we think we still have a long way to go. So tourism is uppermost in our minds, but very important, Jesse, is the discovery of the, our, the genius of our people. The discovery that our people 
have ideas that need to be massaged into viable options of development. Let it not be said that our St. Lucian people are very brilliant. And over the last eight years since I returned to St. Lucia, working in all parts of St. Lucia, from Fort Jolib to Praline, from Greece in Vieux where we have a, 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 a honey processing plant about to, to be completed, to the north. We have people who are ready with ideas. What they need is the policy environment, the nurturing environment, the mentoring environment, and a supportive infrastructure to help them. And we're going to make some recommendations to the government of St. Lucia not um, to create the opportunities so people to emerge with ideas that can be truly transformative. And I have a very supportive board uh, led by Dr. Rose, Rosie Mathre, husband's, mm -hmm. husband's Mathre, and uh, Dave Pollett is on that, uh, Amber Charles, um, Anita James, a number of our St. Lucia luminaries who are contributed in a voluntary capacity to help us te test those ideas in St. Lucia. And uh, we're very thankful for the efforts. And um, Dr. Barbara Graham, who is, was our chair for a while, she has uh, left the committee for, uh, for other things. And we'll, we'll be recognizing herself and also Caroline Eugen, the former PS in Sustainable Development, who helped us significantly for the formative years of the program in St. Lucia. So Monday is the launch of OP7. And St. Lucians will know specifically which areas we're going to focus on. And so far, we have. We are projecting investment of 6.2 million Eastern Caribbean dollars over the next four years. Hopefully, that's the minimum amount, and we're hoping more. In fact, now, uh, the faster we can absorb the money in good projects, the more resources we can bring to St. Lucia. So it's going to be um, a testing time for us, and it's only two of us in the office, <laughs> <laughs> myself and Mrs. Jama, and we are hoping uh, to do a series of training events on how people can access the money, and most yes. of that will be done by Zoom. And next year, we are going to be introducing what we call video proposals. Okay. In a collaboration with the Folk Research Center, I have a colleague at the University of Sheffield who is going to train us in, instead of, you know, a lot of people, most people don't like to write. Proposals can be very intimidating documents, and therefore we are going to see how we can use your smartphone mm -hmm. to tell us about the problem. To make your pitch. Precisely. Mm -hmm. And then um, have a budget to go with it, a monitoring and evaluation plan, and so on. So we're hoping to launch that next year. And uh, we're really hoping that we can enter an exciting period of possibilities, not focus on the depression of the pandemic. Because if you read our <laughs> annual report, there are going to be other pandemics in the future. I have no doubt of that, about that. And um, based on the, the research I'm saying, we have to get prepared to contend with them. We have to get prepared by becoming more internal looking, but also if an external uh, a, a facade as well. You, you mean prompted by our envir environmental impact? <laughs> yes, and by diminishing our environmental impact. You know what, what people don't realize? The more we destroy the environment, the more we make ourselves vulnerable. The, the, the grandfathers of the environment, Coco Charles and Robert DeVoe and those sellers will say, do not destroy the mangroves. We went and we destroyed the mangrove. Now we have sea level rise. The extension officers in the Ministry of Agriculture now telling me we have salinization of our rivers, which means that the seawater is going high up the estuaries and causing the water to become more brackish. And then soon farmers will not be able to get water. So. We have to learn to live with the environment. We need to discover the laws of nature, and we become healthy stewards and partners. The environment is there for us. But if we destroy it, you're going to have a, maybe a more than equal and opposite reaction. You know, <laughs> you know the, there's this law in, in, in physics. To every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Sometimes nature comes back with a reaction that is more. You know, 200 and what, how many persons have been killed by the COVID? I'm not saying that is a reason, but I'm saying we need to understand nature more and we need to live in partnership with nature. We need to become stewards. And I, in my opinion, we can rip out of nature things our own benefits. Wonderful. 
and uh, you, we spoke a little bit about the applications going forward. Uh, what have you seen before in terms of the applicants, their profiles? Who are you targeting, if, if any different, going forward? Going forward, um, I can tell you so far for Jeff Seven, we have on, on our books, we reviewing tomorrow actually our board is missing, meeting, sorry. We are reviewing a project from the SMME, Sufer Marine Management Association, on pollution management and uh, uh, review of the statutory instruments and so on. But we're also looking at the agro-processing project submitted to us by a women's group in St. Lucia, the group run by Catherine Sillies, I think, what's her name? Uh, I forgot the name of the group. It's a women's group uh, focusing on women who are battered and marginalized and so on. So we're hoping that we can contribute significantly to that because if we have effective agro-processing facilities, they become the destination of our farmers' fruits and vegetables. So we have a, we have a value chain mm -hmm. and a production chain, and therefore we can also, you know, we can all benefit in, in many. So these are two projects on the table. Another one is in cassava production. The glycemic index of uh, cassava is very low compared to wheat, and we are trying to see if we can have a project with the um, civil service and multipurpose cooperative. We are hoping that can that that can emerge and so on. So there are a lot of ideas that are coming out and people are beginning to think differently and as we tell them, no idea is a bad idea. Come to us with the awareness of ideas you have. Because of our experience that we have a database of over 24, 25,000 projects, you can go to jeff, sgp, .undp org, and you'll see those projects there. We can possibly take your idea and mold it for you into something that is possible. We can't do it all the time, but sometimes it sparks out and sparks an idea in a different field that we can bring it together. And that's what we we be there for, to help our country, to help St. Lucia, to help the Caribbean uh, and go forward in that respect. Okay, so the next thing coming up, the launch of the seventh operational program Monday. of the Jeff SGP UNDP in St. Lucia come Monday. Yes, live from, I think, 8.30 to 10.30, I think. Okay. It's going to be on NTN, I think, and uh, other platforms as well. Wonderful. So we invite in St. Lucia's to tune in. We will publicize the, the URL and so on, and um, so persons can join us. Wonderful. Thank mm. you very much for being here. Any final words? Oh, yes. Um, I think we in a, in a period where we need to begin to rediscover our strengths and discover the many possibilities there are for us to um, move into sustainable development. I have been amazed by what our people can do, and, I, and there are possibilities out there yet to be tapped in, and we are hoping at the Small Grants Program we can facilitate that uh, new renaissance, so to speak, in discovery of ideas and trial of ideas. And I want to tell solutions in this uh, research and innovation period, we should not be frightened of making errors. Our whole education system, I, I was a product of that, is about not making errors. The basis of research and innovation is about being bold, making the errors, but learning from them and moving on. That's the important thing. Let us not be fearful of making errors. But once you made the errors, learn the lessons and move on. You know, and I recommend those persons who are interested in research and innovation, there's a Netflix documentary on Albert Einstein that, uh, that shows him in the process of discovering the laws of general relativity and the amount of trouble he had, the amount of heartache, Trial how disciplined he had to be. He made a mathematical error. He had somebody who was trying to compete with him to see if they could have discovered the general law before him. He had to send his wife and child back to his birthplace he had to close himself in a room. And then the Eureka moment comes. I am of the opinion that nothing great comes easy. You need to be disciplined. And if there are young people out there, old people out there, women, men who have ideas, I love ideas, come and talk to us. Let's see where, if we can give our legs. But I, I, I end with one <laughs> advice that a professor once gave me. Every great idea, must have a pair of wings and a landing gear. So some ideas fly and they crash. We are going to put that to the test. Does it have a pair of wings and does it have a landing gear? 
Jesse, thank you for the opportunity. A lovely note to end on. Thank you very much for your time today. We really do appreciate it. We have the launch of the seventh operational program of mm -hmm. the Jeff SGP, that's a small grants program of the UNDP in St. Lucia happening come this Monday. We will be reminding you of this launch and hopefully we could get some uh, information filtered down to us uh, on how mm -hmm. persons can take advantage of the opportunities mm -hmm. from the small grants program. My name is Jesse Leons. This is all the time we have today for our morning program. We want to remind Mind you to continue adhering to the protocols. COVID-19 continues to be a real threat here in St. Lucia. Observe the protocols and until next time, do enjoy, keep safe. My name is Jesse Leon signing off for now from the NTN. Goodbye.